Thank you very much for joining us all. And um, welcome back. It's been another quick week, hasn't it? It only seems like yesterday, last Wednesday's webinar. Um, there's been a lot of attention in the last week on JobKeeper. I think firstly, all of us trying to, to navigate our way through the JobKeeper program, uh, whether we're eligible, whether it's the right thing to do. And, and I know a lot of the, um, the decisions and discussions about JobKeeper have broadened more than just financial. You know, they are cultural decisions as well. So um, I, I know that's caused a, a bit of angst for, for some of you. So I hope you've all managed to navigate your way through uh, everything that is JobKeeper. The registration's obviously opened on Monday. So for those of you that have gone through the process, I hope it was, um, I hope it was a good one. I think we find out from this Friday whether it's actually all approved or not. Uh, we were dreading it. I'm sure a lot of you were as well. And um, our finance team had allocated three hours on Monday to input all our staff who we've put through the JobKeeper program. And it took less than 10 minutes. So it was a very seamless, easy process. So I certainly hope it was the same for you. Um, HR Plus did a fantastic webinar uh, in conjunction with GV last week. And I've just learned they're doing another one tomorrow at 11.30. So, and I think some other states and territories are involved with that as well. Um, so HR Plus do a fantastic job as, as most of you are aware. So that webinar's on at 11.30 tomorrow if any of you do want any other extra information on JobKeeper. Um, today we were planning to have a chat about online classes, online resources, but we actually changed tack a couple of days ago to address some other, um, uh, I suppose, more relevant or pertinent issues or themes that have come up in the last few days. And what we're really keen with these webinars is that the information, you're giving up half an hour of your time to join us on Wednesdays. And we really want to make sure that what we deliver is pragmatic, is relevant, and it's useful information to help you, to support you, to give you advice or, or information or tips to help you manage your way through this crisis today, tomorrow, and this week. So that's why we, um, we changed tack for today's session. A bit later in the session, the last five minutes, I'll be chatting to Brad Lowe, um, our General Manager of Member Services, now General Manager of Club Activate. Oh, sorry, that's my cat, Molly. Sorry, Molly, you can't. Apologies. She thought she was part of the webinar, but she's not. Sit down, Molly. Um, where was I up to? Yes, sorry. So I'll be talking to Brad a bit later in the session about some insurance questions that came up from our webinar last week, specifically about the one hand, one foot thing and also insurance uh, regarding online classes and resources that I know a lot of you are thinking about. Um, Brad will also be talking about another issue that's come up earlier this week, which is about One Music, uh, which is, to be honest, something that um, a question was raised by, by one of the states to One Music about the use of music in online classes that we're doing as well. So I'll talk to Brad a little bit about that at the end of today's session. So what we did want to focus on today um, was to speak to a club owner, and thank you very much to Lucy Fifield from Melbourne Gymnastics Centre, who's, um, who's joining us today, to hear firsthand from a club about how, how Lucy's navigating, sorry, get down, how Lucy is navigating um, the current crisis and how we're, and how she is getting ready to get her club back online when we're able to. Um, Lucy joined me in being interviewed by Chip Legrand, the uh, chief reporter from the Age and Sydney Morning Herald on the weekend, and those of you who may have seen the article that appeared in the paper on Sunday, about the importance of community sport. Um, the media, as we see, has been dominated in recent weeks by the AFL and how much they're getting paid and the NRL and when they're starting again. And I was really, really keen to get across the message or to get the message out there about the importance of community sport and community clubs and the role that we, that you, all play and the impact that COVID is having on grassroots sport. I very, very strongly believe that community sport will have an essential, a vital role to play when the world gets back to normal, whatever that normal looks like. Not only in respect of what you offer in terms of 
of physical development and physical skills, but also the social interaction, the social engagement. And really so many of our clubs, of your clubs, are, are the hub of communities. And I think the role that community sport plays in reactivation is going to be a really, really important one. This is a theme that's starting to really come out. And I've had a few questions from a few of you are starting to think about when can we get back? When can we open our doors again? I have a fortnightly meeting with the Federal Minister for Sport, Richard Colbeck, and I asked him that direct question last when or last Thursday, sorry, when we had our meeting last Thursday. And interestingly, the Prime Minister yesterday also started speaking, or Brendan Murphy, sorry, the, the Chief Medical Officer, started talking yesterday about the important role that community sport can play and that the National Cabinet is looking at it. The message that we're getting is it will be very much a community and localised based solution. So unlike midday on March 23rd, when everyone was told to close, it won't be, okay, everyone can open on X date. It will be community and local, locally based and based again on credible evidence and medical evidence. But at least the conversation at that federal level is really starting to turn toward thinking about reopening, which is great. Is it going to happen next week? No. Might it happen next month? I don't know. None of us know when it will happen. But at least what I'm hearing and what I'm talking about in the, the daily conversations that I have with Sport Australia, with the Australian Olympic Committee and with the Federal Minister in our fortnightly meetings is about that importance of supporting clubs now at federal, state and local level to make sure that when, when we're, that we're ready to go, when we're good to go. So that was the basis of the article that, that Chip did. And Lucy, um, very long introduction, sorry for me rambling on, um, but thank you for being part of, that, um, part of that interview. Now Chip spoke to you about that, about the importance of, of community clubs in, in reactivate. So what, what interested in your, in your thoughts on that? Um, so I think uh, for me, when I spoke with Chief, I explained that it's been a huge process for us. Um, my doors were closed on the 13th of March with one of our centres. So I think if it was a Friday, we got a call at 5.30 p.m. from the school and we had to close at 10 p.m. that night. So that was a very quick turnaround in terms of getting out to our staff and the rest and, um, and the ball started rolling from there. Uh, so we were going through a bit of an emotional, I guess, uh, wave uh, a little bit earlier on than some of the other clubs when the government told them to close down, I think it was the 23rd of March. But um, I think it gave me space um, and I definitely needed 10 days at least for myself to recoup and, and get my head around things uh, before I really started to get some clarity. Uh, in regards to how we are reopening, um, I mean, in the current climate, we're all online. Um, and meeting the requirements necessary. Uh, obviously, we have athletes from kinder gym and baby gym right through up to competitive athletes. And so their needs are all different. Um, and so our management team are working very, uh, I guess, carefully with each of those programs. What it will look like moving forward uh, when we go to reopen, um, the conversations and meetings that we're having now with um, competitive coach, high performance coaches, and then obviously recreational fundamental program managers are about how many classes will we be able to offer? How often will we, will we be able to offer them? Um, with our competitive athletes, how we will um, transition, I guess, uh, them back to their full training load. And that will take us up to a term, I would think, um, for those children. And uh, we're talking about obviously numbers in the gym because my my guess is that we will be open, but we won't be able to have as many athletes that we normally do have in our centres, obviously, just sort of going by the um, stage two requirements and the rest. So that's, they're the things that we're considering now and they're the conversations that we're having now. Um, I, we are also having conversations around uh, whether we will reopen all of our programs. Um, we are having conversations around uh, staffing um, and you know, really wanting to work on quality moving forward. And I think for everybody, it's going to be so different because we're all in different areas. Um, whether we are going to be able to open two of our centres immediately because they're part of schools, who knows? Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot to, for us to be considering and it definitely will be um, 
a transitional phase for us. And Lucy, how are you keeping your staff engaged? And I know with us at GA, it, I found it really important. What I've really tried to focus on is making sure that those staff that we've been able to retain, and, and we've turned over almost 50% of our staff in the last three weeks at GA, but those staff that we've managed to retain, how, how do you go about, it's really important that they still feel challenged and fulfilled. Um, how, how are you working with your, your coaches and your staff to, to keep them engaged and to keep them um, challenged? So I think obviously from the beginning, it was just via email uh, to start off with because of the, the amount of staff that we had, 80 staff. Um, and then with the managers, it was a little bit more individual. Um, and between myself and our business manager, Amy, her and I were in, in close contact with our, um, our management team of 12. Uh, and, and then it's been Zoom meetings and they've been smaller meetings. So um, choosing key staff members that um, want to be working on online, for example, uh, smaller meetings and getting and brainstorming and things like that in terms of programming. Um, but uh, the majority of it has been via email, but I have been texting and calling a lot of the staff as well. As I said, between Amy and I, um, sort of administration and then coaching side of things. And then our management team have then been um, having um, further email conversations and, and um, phone conversations with the teams that are under them. So it's just been a bit of a natural flow, really. Something that, um, that I'm also trying to, to do at GA and, and in our, we have multiple daily um, Zoom meetings and team meetings, is to, to sort of challenge everyone with a question every week. What have they achieved this week that they wouldn't have, I call it BC, before COVID, um, to get that sense of fulfilment and that get that sense of challenge. But also for all of us to realise that we can still use this period to get some things done that we wouldn't have had the bandwidth to do before this, you know, that, that we're not all in our normal lives in an office or in a gym from, you know, seven in the morning till seven at night. So um, I suppose what have you learnt or what are you getting done during this period that will actually help you be a better club when we are back to normal? Um, I think the biggest thing for me, and I guess there's been, as I said earlier on with the emotional side of things of going up and down and having to close a business um, for me of 21 years, there was a part of me that was very grateful for this time and space. So um, I haven't been able to give myself that sort of headspace for that amount of time because I've been on the go for so long uh, building a business. So the fact that I have been given some space um, and time to find where my heart lies within the sport um, and then seeing how that sort of flows on to our team and having those kind of conversations with our team um, has been probably the most positive thing out of this whole um, situation. It's been able to give us a space to come up with how we can explore, rebuild, um, reinvent um, and be creative with what we're doing um, out in the gym moving forward. But I think ultimately for all of us having a bit of space and time to go back and sit back and look at what we've done and what, what are we going to be able to make, um, what, what positive changes are we going to make moving forward. I, I think that's a super important point, Lucy, and, and thank you very much for... Um, for giving that answer, I think, and it refers back a bit to, for those of you that were on our first webinar with, uh, with Gemma, our AIS psychologist, where, you know, she was saying to be kind to ourselves, to, to check in with ourselves and to acknowledge, I suppose, where our passion lies, what we really want to do and, and refine what we do um, and do those things that we love and do it in the most effective and efficient way possible when we come out of this. So I think it's, you know, you saying, taking advantage of the time for this headspace is a really important thing for all of us, for all of us to do um, and to come back bigger and better than ever. Um, a saying I always like is never waste a crisis. And as, as hard as it is, how can we make something out of this time that we can all come back from it bigger and better than ever? Something that I think that we have, that we have really seen with this um, that's been pleasing 
we call ourselves a community and, and we are a gymnastics community, gymnastics in Australia community between GA, the states and territories and all the work that they do and obviously all our clubs and all our members. And what I've seen with these forums, the states and territories are holding their own webinars and own forums. I know John Mitchell held, um, has held a couple of, of club forums as well. And that's fantastic to see that our community really banding together and sharing tips, sharing resources, sharing lessons, and really supporting each other through, through the crisis. Um, is that something, Lucy, that, that you found that you've, you've mm. I suppose, closer with, with a network and the community? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously there's over 600 clubs within the country. I have had contact with Northern Territory. I've had contact with Tasmania. I've had contact, obviously, there's a group of four of us um, within um, our, the state that, you know, I mean, we've grown up doing this together, the four of us, and we've been, you know, from the Friday the 13th, I was messaging them all saying, this is happening, guys, and, and the support that we could give one another from there was... Um, very, it was continuous every single day. We were messaging. We've had a couple of Zoom meetings. We've, we've spoken on the phone. We've sh um, we have shared all of our emails with one another. Um, and we are. And in saying that, the four of us are very happy to assist wherever we can in terms of sharing with others. Um, there is a part of us, or sorry, me personally, that has had to go very inward, which I said earlier in the in the other answer. But I have had to go inward before I've come out and you know um, been you know talking and doing and being. Um, but I feel like in terms of the community, I mean, this is our choice to have a business in this sport. Um, and it's our choice as a business owner to take risk. And that's, and that's where we have to ride the waves with what business brings. Whether we're a gymnastics centre or a cafe or whatever that looks like, um, you know, thankfully we have um, people in this community um, that we can lean on. And I know that, you know, I've, people have shared us emails about correspondence with the ATO. I've had, I've shared lesson plans. I've, you know, the correspondence that I had from the schools and things we, we shared immediately. So I know that all of us are happy. To, we're all in this, this together. We're all riding the, the same kind of wave. It's just, you know, um, you know, we're there to hold one another's hands, basically. So that just definitely has happened for us. Yeah. Um, you know, working with states and territories, the GA board has had meetings. We've got another one tomorrow with the state and territory presidents. And it's, you know, never, never more than now uh, is it important, is it as important that we all band together for the support of you guys. And that's certainly what's, what's driving us and what's no, as what I know is driving all the, um, the people around the country who are here so that we can get a sport that we all love um, back up and running in the best possible way. I think um, that also we've had um, Facebook groups and we've had lots of conversations about the state and the national um, organisations and um, we all need to have a bit of faith that, you know, you guys are all doing what you guys can do and we, you know, appreciate all of that and we appreciate the fact that you are sharing everything that's happening with us as well in regards to even what you're doing with your staff and the job keeper side of things and stuff. I think that's important for us as well to know. Um, so we'd just like to acknowledge that as well. Thank you, Lucy. No, I appreciate that. And that's it's certainly been the way that, that I operate, that whatever we do and whatever we're able to share, we will, because it affects you guys at the end of the day. So we're always happy to, um, to share um, as much as we can. Um, Lucy, thank you for joining us today. It's, I've, I've found that a really interesting chat. Um, uh, thank you again for taking part in the CHIP article and also for sharing your thoughts. And I know it, it is hard. We all go through days. You know, I go through days that I just... You know, you almost just want to walk away and, and that's fine. You need to acknowledge that. You need to accept that. We're all going to have days like that. And then we wake up the next day and we're reinvigorated. We say, no, this is not going to beat us. We're, we're going to come yeah. back bigger than ever. But it's, yeah. um, you know, we, we are all vulnerable and we need to show that vulnerability to, to help each other to move on. So thank you very much for your time yeah. today, Luke. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Um, now, Bradley, I haven't seen you on the screen, but I pre oh, there you are. Good. Hello. Um, most of you may know Brad. Uh, he's our General Manager of Member Services in the Ordinary World, uh, now renamed General Manager of Member Services and, and Reactivation. Um, and Brad's team, uh, reduced team now at, uh, at GA, is really looking at 
resources and support for clubs now, but also looking to how we will reactivate. And I know a big, um, a big focus of Brad is the importance of recreational gymnastics and, and communica community and recreational gymnastics as being a really big lever in terms of our reactivation for our clubs when we come out of this. But Brad's also looking after, along with, um, along with Greg Hill, the everything insurance. And so we just wanted to follow up on a few questions that came out from last week's webinar with Marsh, specifically about the one hand, one foot. Um, that's, well, Brad, I'll hand over to you now, if you can maybe sort of give us an update on discussions you've had with Marsh about that particular parameter about online, online programs. Absolutely. Online programs, sorry. Um, one of the, the really interesting things that um, we did when we had clubs come to us um, with the desire to move into um, online um, delivery of classes and really wanting to, to know would the National Risk Protection Program extend to um, individuals doing gymnastics in their own home. Um, so we worked with Mark through our brokers and, and sports cover who, who ultimately insure us. Um, and we tried to really put some some parameters in place so that um, so that the insurers would be comfortable um, to um, extend their coverage outside of a, a traditional gym environment. Um, and that's really where the, the the one hand one foot rule came. Um, the insurers were really keen for us to define or um, uh, make, make a, a definition around what. Um, would be an appropriate at home activity. Um, but over the, the last couple of weeks, and it certainly came to light um, sort of towards the, the end of last week after the webinar, uh, was that um, sort of that one hand, one foot rule doesn't really work for us. Um, and those people who are doing gymnastics still at the moment in their own homes are really at a level where they can, um, where they can work and they can um, do more advanced skills. Um, so I had just seen a, a, a question come up in the chat, what is the one hand, one foot rule? Um, that particular rule was um, around doing gymnastics skills, that one hand or one foot um, needs to stay on the ground at all times. So essentially no aerial work was being done. Um, I've subsequently had a meeting with Sarah from Marsh um, and really started to, to advocate for a relaxation of that rule. Um, to enable uh, gymnasts, particularly at the sort of the more intermediate and advanced level, um, to be able to um, do some more aerial work. Um, she's indicated that they have a desire to explore that some more with us. Um, so we're currently working through with some of our technical experts um, to define what skills could be done at home um, that involves some aerial work. Um, so what we're hoping is to get that resolved really quickly with Marsh and Sports Cover um, and to get a new fact sheet out uh, within the next week, um, which will hopefully see a, a relaxation of that requirement. That's great. Hopefully good news for everyone. And I assume that doesn't mean triple back flips over the couch in the lounge room. <laughs> uh, somewhere yeah. in the middle of one hand, one yeah. foot, and something ridiculous. Yep, that's Absolutely. great. Thank you, Brad. And again, you know, we heard that loud and clear come through and, and you know, Brad and Greg got straight on the phone to, to Marsh to try and find out, okay, how can we make this real and realistic and, and pragmatic? Something else, um, Brad, just quickly, the use of music for online classes, that's come up this week as well. What, what's the situation there? Yeah, it has. So we had a, um, a club inquire with their state association around using music um, online. Um, and uh, we have um, sought clarification from One Music on that. Um, the, the thing at the moment is, is when all this happened, we went to One Music straight away um, and to essentially have the agreement that we were currently negotiating with them to be paused, which essentially means that we would pay no fees and the club would pay no fees for music licensing this year. Um, and obviously, one, one Music were quite um, comfortable with that, um, that obviously we didn't want to put an extra expense on anybody at this particular time. Um, since this has happened, um, obviously if a club does choose to use music 
um, in their online programs. Uh, that club would need to have a license with One Music. Um, and at this particular point, we would ask clubs to negotiate that individually with their clubs, because there's a lot of clubs that A, aren't doing anything online at the moment, but B, if they are, they're not doing anything that requires music. Um, so at the moment, we strongly advise clubs not to use music um, in anything they are delivering online. But if there is a situation where you absolutely have to do that, um, we ask you to go straight to the One Music website um, and to look at negotiate, negotiating an agreement directly with them. Okay, hopefully that's clear for everyone. I think once we've had some more discussions with One Music, we can include that maybe in another fact sheet, um, Brad, just thinking on the fly and putting on the spot. But um, I think that'd be useful to put on a fact sheet and put up on the website as well in the next couple of days for everyone, because I know that's a big one. Sure. Um, and just, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I think this is really good content. There's just a question come through, what is one hand, one foot rule? Uh, that was basically yeah. the initial insurance parameters yeah. around, around what you are covered what Marsh will cover you to do at home. Um, and that was that you had to have one hand or one foot on the ground at any time. Um, and Brad, we did sort of clarify this, I think actually in the, in the John Mitchell Club forum, this was clarified, but perhaps not for everyone on this group, the clarification around insurance rules for filming online classes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think certainly there was, um, there was a, a misunderstanding on Sarah's behalf uh, yesterday. Oh, sorry, last week um, around, he thought that there were athletes in the gym delivering classes that were filmed to go online. Um, and that's obviously why she, she then said, no, that, that wasn't something that, that was able to be done. Um, obviously we clarified that with Sarah and yes, staff can go into the gym as their workplace um, and film online classes, obviously ensuring that, that safe hygiene practices and social distancing practices are maintained uh, at all times. Yep, okay. Um, a good question just come through and it's something that we've discussed about using these online, you know, and maybe this is something that we all, you know, this becomes a thing moving forward and these online classes don't stop after this period. It, it, you know, is that a whole nother opportunity for you guys to expand the services that you can offer as clubs? So questions come through, Brad, um, about uh, extending the reach of those online programs to current non-members. I'm not sure if the question was from an insurance point of view, but I, I think, to be honest, overall, it's a great yeah. idea to try and expand your, your base. Yeah, it is, absolutely. And, um, and uh, Greg, um, who's our GM of Finance and Operations, and I had this conversation only yesterday about potentially looking at a new membership category that is online only um, during this time to, to enable people to, to try gymnastics in an online environment during this time and then obviously once we're allowed to reopen to come back through and, and potentially convert them into a full member. Yep. So again, Fantastic. We're, we're, the, the conversation started, only started yesterday, but the, the conversation only started. Um, and Good, so yeah, you have so an answer to tomorrow. Right. Have an answer for you tomorrow, yeah. Good, well done, that's what I like. 48 hour turnaround. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, that that's something that what good can, can we create out of this? You know, this is a whole new world for, for a lot of us. And I know in, in the US, they've got onto it well and truly. Um, and we're talking to people in the US as well. And we hope to bring you that in the next couple of weeks. Um, thank you, Brad. I think that's been really useful information. And, you know, this is certainly what we want to do with these weekly webinars to try and keep it to 30 minutes. So I've got about 30 seconds to wrap up. Um, uh, but to bring you information and updates that, that we feel are relevant that, that can help you um, today and tomorrow. So, Brad, thank you very much. Lucy, also, thank you again. Um, so if I can ask you, there's just a, uh, one question that's come up and someone else oh. said, can we answer it? Um, is there oh, any sorry. updates on the ability to hire out small equipment, such as kinder gym slides, et cetera, and mats? Um, that is also a conversation we're having with Marsh and Sports Cover at the moment as well. Um, and it, uh, essentially it's just to, to ensure that um, that's covered under the National Risk Protection Program. Um, Sarah was quite, quite adamant in her conversations with us on Monday that, um, that you know, there's nothing stopping people from doing this. It's just if there's an accident that occurred, it wouldn't be covered. So we're trying to ensure that the coverage is, is as broad as possible. So it is part of the conversation that I'm having with Sarah yet. Great, so an update on that soon as well. Excellent. 
Thank you for those questions um, that have come through. As per usual, if uh, anyone has any other questions, to please email them. Now I'm going to forget the, is it support at gymnastics.org.au or club support at gymnastics? Support at gymnastics.org.au. Club Sorry, support. say that again. Club, right. club, club support. support. Yeah club support at gymnastics.org.au, sorry. And um, again, any topics that you feel are relevant um, that, that you uh, would like us to bring you, please let us know. Next week, we're planning on doing this on child safety. Um, as you're all aware, child safety is, is number one priority um, for us from, from the board down to management with everything that we do. So we'll have our National Child Safe Manager, Brooke Irvine, joining us next week for our webinar. And in this, perhaps in this day and age, just as much, if not more, um, we still need to be aware of our child safe codes of behaviour and our child safe policy. So Brooke will be talking about how we can all imply, apply that, how we make sure that we ensure our current landscape and our current environment remains one that is supportive and safe uh, for all our children taking part in gymnastics. So I look forward to that next week. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us again today. I think it's been a really um, informative session. Thank you very much, Lucy, for giving up your time. Thanks, Brad, for all your answers. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I um, hope you're having a great week. And please contact us if we can help in, in any way. And, of course, your, your State and Territory Association as well in the first instance. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>